Uh, hi everyone, welcome to the latest video in the Finding Your First Bug series. Today we're going to be talking about cross-site scripting, or XSS. Um, so, what is cross-site scripting? So, it's very simply the ability to run your own JavaScript on a web page. Um, so, there are many different types, which is DOM. Uh, the payload is injected via the DOM, e.g. in a redirect. This is when you have headers in JavaScript. Um, and they just uh, put the um, the JavaScript directly in the header, basically. Um, we have stored, where um, the payload gets stored by the server, for example, in a form, and it's run whenever that page is accessed because it gets reflected back. Uh, and then reflected where the payload has to be run by the user specifically. So you might have like a query string. And then that might have the XSS payload inside, but the the pay the user has to specifically run that. Um, I'm going to be focusing on stored XSS in this video because it's the most impactful, um, and it's the easiest to explain. Um, the more complex ones are really difficult to explain, and I think that um, it just it makes it a little bit easier to focus on this side. So this is a new slide that isn't in, usually in in these slides um what's the impact so i'm going to be talking more about this uh because i think my videos were missing it a little bit and that was more information on just the impact so the impact of an xss used to be stealing cookies which is that you send the cookies of a vic of a victim to your domain to run actions as a user right and you can log in as them but it's not necessarily the true impact of xss anymore um because a lot of cookies are set to http only um, and they're secure, so you can't access them like you used to be able to do. And the more interesting ones are these kind of two second ones. So the first one is password autofill. If someone has a password manager, it can autofill the password in. And an XSS payload can capture the data by just waiting for that to be filled in. Um, which is a really interesting use case of it. And the most common one is the CSRF impact. So there's going to be a full video on CSRF as a standalone bug, but as this kind of um, example, it's kind of the best impact to focus on because you can perform actions as the user by sending the data to another endpoint in the web app. So what does that mean? So when we create a, when we log into a web page, we kind of saved in some way, right? We saved as cookies and our web browser just knows you're automatically logged in. So what happens if you abuse the fact that you are automatically logged in to um, basically make that jump between um, uh, one user to do an action without them knowing. So a very simple example is you send the request to the API that's like change their username or change their password without the user actually knowing because it's been executed on the website using cross-site scripting. Um, so this is a great thread by Tom Nom Nom um, about XSS and the actual impact of it. Um, so CSRF, a bug that abuses the fact the user is logged in to perform actions on their account. Um, so it's really mitigated as a standalone bug by having a CSRF token. The web app knows what it, the value it expects to be. If it's wrong or missing, the action won't work. However, if you have XSS, you can call it from within the same web app, bypassing that because you have access to the CSRF token because you're that website, right? So you really have this like different impact of XSS. Um, and I really wanted to highlight this thread in particular because I think it's really useful to understand how XSS is actually being used um, and, and what, what the actual impact is. So what makes them great first bugs? Um, I actually don't think they are. Um, they require a lot of knowledge on bypassing security features, but they end up being someone's first bug due to their abundance on CTFs. And actually they're not as common on CTFs, on, on real web apps as they are on CTFs, a lot like other bugs. They don't really require burp, although burp can be really useful. And I'm going to recommend the following method to do it. So step one is to find or write an XSS payload which demonstrates impact. You should be able to write a CSRF payload that actually will give some impact. 
Um, alert 1 is good when you're learning, but remember, bug hunting is not about getting alert.1 to fire and getting a flag. It's all about impact. It's all about getting something that works. Uh, step 2, which can really be done at the same time, is to find a vulnerable form. Now, you can spam alert 1 there, because that will give you an idea of which ones are vulnerable, and then you input your payload. So, this is a super simple approach to finding cross-site scripting with a focus on the impact of cross-site scripting, not just getting the cross-site scripted bug. Um, there are plenty of bypasses available on like OWASP, um, has like a ton of XSS bypasses. Um, so does uh, Twitter as well. Twitter you'll find on bug bounty tips, you'll find quite a lot of um, XSS bypasses. Um, but just remember, I think it's often forgotten in some of these attacks, and uh, this is a technical attack, but you've got to demonstrate impact. You've got to show how an attacker could actually use it. Um, and I think it's super interesting that I, that people don't, like people don't put their mind into a hacker. Like the big point of bug bounty hunting is to exploit it and see what you can do with it to a point. <laughs> um, so let's look at some cross-site scripting in the wild. Um, I just wanted to, to start with like a quick word on cross-site scripting. Um, as you'll see in the examples, it requires some creativity to find, bypass, or exploit. Please don't feel bad if you can't find cross-site scripting. They are honestly difficult to find. Like, they are not as easy as CTFs make them out to be, and they're not as easy as people like putting in payloads would have you believe. A lot of these XSS will not just demonstrate alert one, but also demonstrate some kind of impact. Um, and I'm also going to focus on stored cross-site scripting because I do think that it's a lot easier to work with than DOM. Although feel free in your time now to spend like Google it and um, look for your own uh, information on it. I really don't know that much about cross-site scripting. I don't think it's a very good first bug, and I don't think that it's as easy as people make it out to be uh, although a lot of people like it as their first bug i think it's just because you can maybe copy and paste things but you can't because you need to actually exploit it um so this is a really simple one um they found a vulnerable form and they put in a payload and it pops up and that's it um, so one, this is another example, you haven't really demonstrated the impact. And the impact they've listed here is stored excess in the extress field in billing activity. Which isn't the impact, that's just the um, e <laughs> explanation of the bug. Um, it is worth saying that this did pay out though, so even if you can't get that level of exploitation, if you can fire alert one, they will pay out, it just won't be as high. Uh, and this is a very simple payload, right? This is a payload you can find on Twitter. Um, and all they've basically done here is try every single field in, um, in, in a form. Um, and that's worth trying. It really is just spam everywhere, alert one. Um, sometimes you'll be dealing with kind of working out what the filter says, uh, and we'll discuss this here. So we have a very similar bug to this one. Um, which is a user must press a certain button combo for the payload to fire and it bypasses some XSS filters. Now this uh, OWASP cheat sheet here, this one, is so good. It has every single bypass someone could possibly think of. You need to know how to use the bypass, however, it's so useful. And here we can kind of see that um, they've used access key X on click alert, so they're um, doing shift control option X. Um, so this is an example of kind of more creative, uh, looking at kind of the, um, bypassing the filter for XSS. Um, and you'll see quite a lot of these that have kind of weird payloads. And that's because your standard alert one payload is not going to fire on most websites because there's filters. Um, okay. So now we're going to get into the more creative XSS locations. Um, this is when we start to really see how difficult XSS is actually is to find in reality. 
Um, so in this one, they uploaded a file which contains data that will be imported into an application. Easy enough, it contains a CSV. They intercept the request to modify the imported data and change the file name to include an XSS payload. So here we've actually changing it to sample SVC SKU.csv and then alert document domain. Um, and the payload will file when the page is then loaded because as it tries to read the file name, it's going to fire the payload. Um, and the important thing to note here is that they've they've included an impact statement that's very targeted to the tar very tailored to the target to actually put it into their world of what they understand about uh, business and what their business. Um, so this is kind of um, an example of a kind of basic kind of XSS that uses quite a lot of creativity. Um, and this is where you're more likely to find XSS nowadays. You're not going to find it as much on forms because people realize it's there. But what you're going to find it more is like the weird ways that data gets processed by an application. You know, if you're uploading a data, if you're uploading data, if you're you know, sometimes you can inject JavaScript because it's calling it's calling some JavaScript and it's not really filtering stuff, rather than being like, okay, I have to close the HTML and put in alert one. Um, okay, wiki pages. This is again another creative method to fire an XSS payload, right? Um, so you split the, up the payload to bypass any filters. So here, the page slug is given JavaScript colon. And the page name is given xss.alert1, uh, which is really interesting because this allows the XSS to fire by a breadcrumb link. Because it wouldn't be that wouldn't be something you'd usually find in XSS, but sometimes you've got to be thinking more out of the box than um, than your standard uh, your standard kind of uh, filling out a form. Um, because if you just fill out the form, it wouldn't work. You'd get caught by the filter. But doing it this way, the kind of more um, creative method. And this is how you find XSS nowadays. They tend to be the more creative methods than the whole uh, copy, especially the ones that pay out. Um, okay. So the next one is about cookie manipulation. So this is a good example of exploiting an XSS further than alert one. So in this example, XSS is used to bypass a uh, cause, um, which I'm going to go over in my CSRF video. Um, but it basically means being able to call an API from another uh, domain and getting the information back. And this is used to successfully steal cookies, even though they are set to be HTTP only, because the XSS fires on a domain trusted by the main Grammarly domain, which is the target in this case, and then returns back to them the cookie because it thinks it's another Grammarly application. And this is what I mean, well, when you create an XSS, you have to exploit it all of the way um, and actually create something kind of interesting. Um, so th that was very short kind of introduction. I don't think XSS are very appropriate as uh, first bugs. And I kind of wanted to demonstrate that actually alert one isn't enough to get a good payout for an XSS nowadays. Um, it's so difficult to find an XSS, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't really be fun to watch. Be like, look, we'll try like 30 different payloads and nothing will work. So thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next video. Bye.